does it match the... Your head, your head would probably... Make 16. Your, no, the middle. your fellow audience members by abstaining from conversation during the debate. Uh, there will be a question and answer period following the debate, and at this time we encourage you to come uh, bring your questions. Uh, the Socratic Club, it was founded by C.S. Lewis in 1941 at Oxford University to explore the intersections of Christianity, contemporary society, and culture. We continue this tradition in honor of his commitment to the frank and open discussion of beliefs. If you are interested, our next debate will be on November 16th in Gilfillan Auditorium on the topic of euthanasia and can we die with dignity. Uh, so, Jesus, he is a strikingly controversial figure, and his impact on the world is fiercely debated. Tonight's debate will be investigate whether the world needs Jesus. We'll be asking, who is Jesus of the Bible, and what does he have to offer to the world? Should his voice be heard, this is merely one among many appeals of many pundits that uh, compete in the marketplace of ideas. Has he come to save humankind and show the way to salvation? Is he a good man whose example we should follow, or is there more to his person? Does the world need him? And if we do, what is the nature of that need? Our speakers will explore these issues and advance divergent arguments. Our first speaker tonight is Dr. Martin Emmerich. Martin Emmerich is the pastor of Westminster Presbyterian Church here in Corvallis. He holds a BA in Law from the University of Frankfurt in Germany and a PhD in Biblical uh, Hermeneutics from Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia. He is the author of uh, New Mythological Concepts in the Epistle to the Hebrews and several articles on New Testament criticism. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Martin Emmerich. of this debate, it was quite clear to me from the outset that there wasn't to be much compromising. And so some of the things that I may say tonight may sound or come off a bit harsh. So please forgive me. Does the world need Jesus? What we need may be no more than what we want. I may stare at the interior of an open refrigerator at the middle of the night and uh, say to myself, I need some food, when in fact I'm not even hungry, <laughs> I'm just bored. It is not a secret that we live in a consumerist society and the system rests on the ability of the marketplace to uh, not only satisfy needs, it certainly can and does do that, but to create needs and to open new markets, new opportunities, new ventures. For this reason, we are at a disadvantage when contemplating the question of what or whom we need, as in, does the world need Jesus? How does it feel when you are a diehard Beatles fan and you learn that all of their albums have been digitally remastered? and are now available in a most attractive collector's box set, each album in a slip cover. Of course, we consumers should never think of ourselves as hapless stoops of the system, falling prey to one marketing prank after another. The relationship between uh, producer and consumer is a little more complex than that, involving giving and taking. But it remains, and I think that we can all agree with that, that needs are constantly being manufactured in an effort to keep the money flowing. There is nothing that you can sell that can't be sold. It does not surprise us, therefore, that Jesus Christ, too, has become a marketable product. There are, in fact, quite a number of Jesuses available for the shopper. Jesus the charismatic, Jesus the exorcist, Jesus the itinerant cynic philosopher, 
Jesus, the magician. Jesus, the prophet of social change. And Jesus, the Jewish eschatological prophet. If you don't like any of these, you can build your own Jesus, <laughs> choosing any of these options and perhaps adding your own, the way that you would personalize your dish at the local Mongolian grill. <laughs> well, let me pose a question to you in a slightly altered form. Does the world really need Jesus, the itinerant cynic, no more than it does Bob Dylan, Marilyn Monroe, or Karl Marx? For I take the question, does the world need Jesus, not only to have universal appeal, that is appealing to all of us, appealing to every human being, but ultimate significance. That is, if I cannot say that the human race needs Jesus in the same way that a starving child in sub-Saharan Africa needs food, then he's just one among many products to choose from. Then we don't really need him, do we? So before we can answer the query, does the world need Jesus, we must decide which Jesus are you talking about. <laughs> now, you may not like this, you may not necessarily agree with this, uh, but it is certainly true that the Jesus of the New Testament is the divine Son of God, who united to himself human flesh in order to die for the sins of the world. He was raised from the grave for his justification, and he is now still preached in the world. This is the Jesus that I believe in, and this is the Jesus that I believe the world does still desperately need. Now, there are many who read the same Bible that I read and yet affirm that he is not divine, nor that he atoned for sin to satisfy God's demand for retributive justice. Those who deny these truths, which have traditionally defined and shaped the Christian faith, can do so by not playing with a full deck of cards. Any saying of Jesus, such as uh, the popular Son of Man sayings with an eschatological import, anything that a New Testament author says about Jesus, if it does not fit into the portrait of a given Jesus, can be declared as a later accretion to the Jesus tradition, a fabrication of the church. So the real historical Jesus lies buried, um, lies buried under layers of church dogma. I do not intend to waste precious time to speak about the authority of the Bible. The leitmotif of this debate is, after all, does the world need Jesus? And I answer this question, yes, yes, the world desperately needs him because God and man are at war. And he came to reconcile us to God, to beat swords into plowshares, to offer us peace, to forgive us our sins. And this is not to be taken for granted, as in I've heard it before, and not just once. Because God's justice is inflexible. In the words of Carnegie Simpson, forgiveness to man is the plainest of duties, but to God it is the profoundest of problems. In the cross of Christ, in the death of Christ, and in the resurrection of Christ, God has solved that problem. <clears throat> Namely, how he can forgive sinners such as us, and never ever to bring them up again holding them against us, and at the same time to right the eternal scales of justice. There are many signs in the world that things are not right with us. Begun by commenting on how our market-driven consumerist society creates idols that we end up worshiping. We live in Vanity Fair, and we like it that way. Yes, we do. But one desire fulfilled does not result in happiness, as you all know. 
does not make you content, and if it does, or if it should, then it won't last long. We move from one experience of thrill and satisfaction to the next and still not find peace. Nothing is good enough. Nothing is of lasting value. Nothing is enough. We look to the heroes of our age and our society in the movies and in entertainment. And we say, well, they have everything that life can offer. They should be happier than the rest of us. But are they? And if not, what ails them? For the rest of us, there seem to be but two options. Either compete in American Idol for our own share in fame and perceived greatness. Or join the human race. Live the ordinary, mundane life in the human plane. Mundaneness is another problem of ours that we shouldn't underestimate. We encounter it in life, in the home, in the family, in our relationships, at the workplace. It is also part of the curse of human fallenness due to sin. The earth no longer yields its bounty without toilsome labor and a good dose of frustration. Much of what we do occurs in a fog as on cruise control and routine behavior may make us efficient in what we do, maybe even good and excellent at what we do, but those same routines also make us feel like cogs in a machine and less like human beings. But some of these tasks may be more meaningful than others, and still they work together ceaselessly in making us long for relief from the doldrums of toil and labor. All we can do in the words of one of the characters in the movie Office Space, which I love, <laughs> is that we hang around long enough, just long enough, for good things to happen, somehow. But let's look into our own hearts and let's be quite honest, as honest as we can, for a moment. We all want to be God in our own right. We all want to be first. We all are inherently selfish. And there is a pervasive narcissism in most, and I would argue in some sense, even in all of our decisions and actions in life. We may be polite about it because this is what is politically correct, but at the end of the day, we are locked in competition with everyone else for the throne of supremacy. Let me make this short and painful by quoting the king of cynics, Gore Vidal. It is not enough to succeed, others must fail. And every time I hear of the success of a friend, a little piece of me dies. <laughs> Shockingly honest, ugly and brutal, and yet do we not know that it is also true? We are torn between wanting to be God ourselves and desiring to see all other contestants for the throne to be, to be cast down from their pedestals. We have this basic, this intrinsic, demonic drive. We need to be saved from ourselves. But the most obvious sign that the world is not what it ought to be, that we are not what we ought to be, is death. Allow me to engage you in sharing a few morbid thoughts. <laughs> For all the mechanisms that we employ to sanitize death, to neutralize it, or perhaps even to make it an object of sentimentality of some saccharine uh, flavor, it is so <clears throat> universal and not one of us gets around it. Life sucks and then you die. <laughs> is what a sticker says that I saw on a car not too long ago. This may not be too deep, it may not be too creative, 
but it is also true.